We might wonder uh, a little bit about uh, the nature of uh, human intelligence. And we might uh, reflect a little bit on the kind of intelligence we've been talking about in the past few weeks. It's been an intelligence of sorts. Uh, those programs support vector machines boosting. They can do really smart things. But the peculiar thing about systems that use those methods is that those systems don't have any idea about what they're doing. They don't know anything. So they don't give us very much of an insight into the nature of human intelligence. And after all, we'd like to have a model of human intelligence because, let's face it, we're the smartest things around. So there are lots of ways to approach that question. And we'll approach that question first from a evolutionary point of view. Some scientists believe, me for instance, that we have a family tree that looks about like this. Too small to see much of that, but the main point is that um, we haven't been around very long. Uh, we humans have been around maybe 200,000 years, and the dinosaurs died out 60 million years ago. So in the blink of an eye, uh, we seem to have uh, more or less taken over. When you look at uh, that uh, family tree at a scale where you can see it, one of the characteristics is increasing brain size. There we are on the left. Chimpanzee on the right. Plainly, mostly mouth, not too much brain in there. That one uh, down below uh, is a reconstruction of one of those Pithecus type <coughs> bipedal apes from about four million years ago or so. So we became bipedal a long time before we had much of a brain. So we might think that, well, maybe brain size has uh, got a lot to do with it. And I suppose it does. So we can plot uh, brain volume of the, uh, our ancestors versus time. So the picture I just showed you was from about three million years ago, I guess. And then up on the upper right-hand corner, oh, that's not just us. That's also the Neanderthals. Their brains might have been slightly bigger than ours. So it isn't just brain size. Here's what that guy looks like. Um, that's a Neanderthal. <laughs> of course, on the left. And that's one of us on the right. Uh, some conspicuous differences. They have big heads. Uh, the rib cage is uh, kind of conical in shape. We've got a large pelvis. People like, make, like to make a lot of speculations about how they must have moved around. But one thing is plain. They didn't amount to much. They could make stone tools, but their stone tools didn't change much over tens of thousands of years. And that was pretty much the story with us, too, until something happened, probably in southern Africa, probably in a group of individuals, maybe less than 1,000. Uh, what's the evidence for that? The evidence for that is mostly uh, comes from uh, DNA um, studies with a lot of probabilistic assumptions and Monte Carlo simulations. But it seems that among the competing hypotheses for how we came to populate the world, it seems that there was a group of us homo sapiens in southern Africa that got something that nobody else had. And, 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 the, and, the, and the highest probability scenario is that we quickly took over. Uh, that population of homo sapiens dominated the rest, went out of Africa, and within the blink of an eye did that sort of stuff. What's that sort of stuff? Uh, those, are on the, those two paintings are from Lascaux, about 25,000 years ago. Paleoanthropologists like Tatters all take that as plain evidence that there was symbolic thought in the people who are around at that time, us homo sapiens. The uh, head is a carving off of um, mastodon uh, tusk of a woman 25,000 years ago, also plainly symbolic. People were making uh, a lot of uh, jewelry and doing self-adornment. The Neanderthals never seemed to do that. That jewelry making seems to have gone back to southern Africa, maybe 70,000 years ago. People were puncturing seashells and using them as necklaces, apparently. So something happened, and, and the paleoanthropologists 
uh, who write fascinating stuff don't quite know how to talk about it other than to say that it looks like we became somehow symbolic. And somehow that has something to do with language. So if you talk to Noam Chomsky, he will say, let me get this precise. This is near as quotation as I can get. He thinks it was the ability to take two concepts and put them together to form a third concept without disturbing the original concepts and without limit. And each part of that's important. The without limit part is what separates us from species that might be able to do that a little bit. But we can do it without any apparent limit. So that's a, a linguist speaking, and he talks a lot about the merge operation and combinators in language uh, uh, using terms that are foreign to us. They don't use the term combinator. It's a kind of computer science term. But whatever it is, it seemed to happen about that time. It was, didn't happen slowly in proportion to brain size. It seemed to happen all of a sudden in consequence of a brain that had grown big enough to be an enablement. Uh, but the capability was not, pulled, was not what pulled evolution in that direction. So I believe that whatever that was, that capability, enabled humans, us humans, to tell and understand stories. And that's what separates from us from the other primates. That ability to, that symbolic ability, whatever it is, enabled storytelling and understanding, and that's what all of education is about, and that's why our species is special. So what we're going to talk about today is uh, some, uh, something you might think of as an instantiation of that hypothesis, uh, one way of thinking about it. And it's a way of thinking about what the linguists would call the inner language. It's not the language with which we communicate. It's the language with which, with which we think, which is closely related to the language which with, with which we communicate, but may not be quite the same thing. So many of you are bilingual. Krishna is bilingual. Bi Krishna, have you ever had the experience of remembering that someone said something to you, but not remembering what language they used? <laughs> How about you, Sonia? Have you had that experience? Yes, I don't what? So you don't, no one's had the experience of having, Leonid, have you ever had that experience of having remembering, remembering some conversation but not remembering the language in which it was cast? Well, remember something, you usually don't know what language was that way. You usually don't remember. So that's a, common, that's a common view. You remember something was said that there was a conversation that had some content, but, but if it's with a speaker of your own language and you're embedded in another place, you often don't remember what language the conversation was in. Is that right, Juana? You remember things like that? Not sure? So sometimes you, sometimes you don't have that confusion, she says, because you always speak to particular people in a particular language. But many people report that they have that experience of not remembering which language uh, something was said in. Well, OK, so what are we going to do? We need an inner language. And maybe we can start just by saying, let's have Let's have something that looks sort of familiar to us. We, 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 we have an object, and it's um, supported by some other objects. So those are support relations. That's one example of what we might call a semantic net. It's a network. It's got nodes and links. It's got, it's got, it has some meaning. That's where the word semantic comes from. Or we might have another example that looks like this. There's uh, Macbeth. There's uh, Duncan. And Macbeth murders Duncan. And we also know somehow that there's a kill involved as a consequence, and that ultimately Duncan uh, has a property and that property is the property of being dead. So there's another semantic net recording something that happens in Shakespeare's Macbeth plot. Now we can decorate that a little bit so as to get a couple of other concepts in play. Uh, first of all, the, the thing we've got already is we've got combinators. <coughs> 
Ben Kam Ben A Tors. Not a fancy name for those links that connect the nodes. Another thing we've got is an opportunity for connecting the links themselves. So the murder sort of implies the kill, and the kill leads us to conclude that the victim is dead. So that is treating the links themselves as objects that can be the subject or object of other links. So we call that process reification. Now, in artificial intelligence, uh, semantic nets were all over the early work. But you know, if you have a big network that covers the wall, you need some way of sort of putting a spotlight on some pieces of it. So Marvin Minsky put a lot of technical content into that idea and created uh, the notion of a notion that deserves another call, a color here. He suggested that we need a localization process so we have frames, so-called frames or templates. And a frame for this murder action might be that there's a murder frame that has an agent and has a victim. And the agent is Macbeth. And the victim is Duncan. So that's a, a way of putting a kind of localization layer on top of what we've got so far. And later on, I'll add sequence to that list. So this is where it rested for a long time, and, and in some sense still rests there, because this, as, soon as, you've got, as soon as you've got combinators and reification, you've got something that's pretty, that's pretty much universal. You can do anything with it. The trouble is, it's sort of down at the bit level. It's like assembly code. It doesn't have, as a concept, enough organization to help you uh, go to the, to the next level of achievement. There's also a little problem here uh, that uh, deserves also uh, some a, a mention. And that is that we have, over this whole thing, the problem of parasitic semantics. Parasitic semantics. A kind of ugliness that surrounds this whole concept. Because when we look at a diagram like that, and we say, oh, Macbeth murdered Duncan, that means Duncan's the victim. Uh, we know that there must have been a motive. Uh, maybe Macbeth wanted to be king. We, all, we know all that stuff. And there's a tendency to project that knowing into the machine. If you're going to uh, play with your telephone, please leave. So if, uh, if we project meaning into that, that that's, that's, that's our understanding. That's not the machine's understanding. So much of the meaning can be said to be parasitic. It's a, it's, it's a parasite. We're, we're the parasite, and we're projecting the meaning into that thing. Putting that diagram into some machine form doesn't mean the machine knows anything. It might be able to conclude some things, but its understanding is not grounded in any, in any kind of contact with the physical world. So we have to worry a lot about that. And if we were, if we were philosophers, we'd stop there and go off and write a few books on the subject. But we're not philosophers, so we're going to just mention the problem and, and go, go barreling ahead. So, uh, we need to use this notion of semantic net, and we have to ask ourselves some questions about what elements of the inner language are most useful. In the end, it might be very complicated, but here's usefulness number one, the notion of classification. So we know about stuff, and, and we know about, for example, pianos. And we know about tools. And we know about max. But we know about those things on different levels. So when I say I, I, I'm thinking about a tool, do you have a very good image of what I'm talking about? The answer has to be no, because the notion of a tool is very vague. So it's hard for you to form a picture of what that's all about. 
On the other hand, if I say I'm thinking about a Mac, well, this is interesting because there's lexical ambiguity there. You don't know if I'm talking about the, the apple type Mac or the apple type Mac, or uh, should I say the fruit uh, or the computer. So there's lexical ambiguity there at two levels, or more. But let's fill this in a little bit. If I, know about, if I know I'm talking about a piano, you can form a picture of that. So that seems to be at a more detailed level where you can do hallucination. At a higher level, you have just a musical instrument. And I can give you a tool to think about by writing hammer. And if I'm going to have a Mac, it's going to be an apple. And in this case, I want you to think about a fruit. And down here, I can be more specific about these things, too. I can, I can add a, a slight refinement of detail and say I'm thinking, about, I'm thinking about one of these. Do you know what this is? No, it's, a, it's not a mirror hammer. It's a ball peen hammer. In some circles, it's called a lady's hammer. I don't know why. Uh, but it's, what's it for? Most people buy it mostly because it's small and lightweight. But in fact, it's for metalworking. It's for taking a piece of sheet metal and pounding it out into an ashtray or something. Or for seating rivets. It's a metalworker's hammer. So you might not have known about that before, but now at least you have a word to hang that knowledge on. It's a ball-peen hammer. So we have various levels here, going from very specific to very general. And we could even go to a level of specificity for pianos by saying that we've got a Bosendorfer. Why is a Bosendorfer special? I mean, is it like a Baldwin? Or is it something, I mean, not Yoka. Yeah. Lots of piano types. What's special about? Well, you see, you don't know because you, unless you play the piano, and probably unless you're a serious piano player, you don't know that a Bosendorfer, Ariel, you know. It's got some extra keys at the bottom. And most people don't know that unless they're serious about the piano. Some professional piano players, when they're confronted with a Bosendorfer, have to, have to have someone cover those keys because it screws up their peripheral vision and they hit the wrong key because they're not used to having those extra keys at the bottom. So that's a, that's, that's a little detail about the Bosendorfer. So you can make a kind of graph, and you can say, let's go from, oh, very general, to a sort of basic level, to a specific level. And so it is, this, it is the case in, in human knowledge that that graph has a tendency to look sort of like this. So here's tool, here's hammer, here's ball peen. So that level where you have a big jump, that's the general to basic level transition. So that basic level is probably there because that's the level at which we, on which we hang a huge amount of our knowledge. We know a lot about pianos, and, and, and it all seems to be hanging on that word piano, which gives us power over the concept. So that's example number one of, a inner, of, an, of an element of our inner language, the ability to assemble things into hierarchies like that and to hang knowledge about those objects into the, in that hier on, on the elements in that hierarchy. But given that you have elements in the hierarchy to talk about, how do you talk about them? Well, I like to consider the possibility, just for the sake of illustration, that you're thinking about a car crashing into a wall. So you've got the things to think about, like the speed of the car, the distance to the wall, and the condition of the car. And you've got the period before the crash, during the crash, and after the crash. So you might want to think about how to talk about those objects in those three time periods. <laughs> 
So we can do that with a vocabulary of change. And we do that because we believe that most of human thinking is thinking about change causing change. And that flies in the face of what we learn as engineers. Because in, engineers, in engineering, we learn about state. And once you know the state of a system, you know everything you need to know in order to predict the future. The trouble is, in our heads, thinking about everything there is in the world, including the current phase of the moon, is too much stuff. So mostly, our thinking, we think, is, is hinging on the idea that change leads to change. So that's why we have a vocabulary of change. So, the, so in the period before the crash, the speed of the car is not changing. There's a little notation for not change, no delta. The distance to the wall, that's decreasing. The condition of the car, well, that's not changing. But then the car hits the wall. So the speed of the car disappears. The distance to the wall disappears. And the condition of the car will change dramatically. Finally, after the crash is over, the speed of the car does not appear. The distance to the wall does not change. And the condition of the car also does not change. So that's hinting at a vocabulary of change and its use, which will be the second element in our development of a vocabulary of ways in which we might have uh, constructed our inner language. So this uh, particular idea, that's classification. This is transition. And in any system that purports to understand stories, there'll be a heavy emphasis on this notion of transition. And we believe, that is to say, I think, that that vocabulary has to have decrease, increase, change, appear, and disappear. So there are 10 things that you can have in such diagrams. Uh, I've done five. That's because for each of those, there's a not variation on that. So vocabulary of 10 things can go a long way toward helping you to describe things that are in process of changing or making transition. And we have a lot of those words in our, in our vocabulary. We use those words a lot in our vocabulary. They seem heavily connected with vision. Our friend appeared. Uh, the cat disappeared. The speed increased. So this is a description of a crash in terms of those kinds of elements. Now I say to you, how does a camera work? Well, I could say a camera works because a photon hits a photoreceptor. A photon, a photon crashes into a photoreceptor. So when I say a photon crashes into a photoreceptor, why am I saying that and how does it help? It, it, I'm saying that and it helps because it's the same pattern of change that you already know about when you talk about a car crashing into a wall. How does that work? The speed of the photon. The distance of the photon to the receptor. and the condition of the receptor. So analogies like that are, the, are very much at the core of what we think about all the time. In any event, there is, there is representation number two. Number one is class, number two is transition, and now you're ready for number three, which is trajectory. Linguists who study sentences uh, often talk in terms of fundamental patterns that seem to be in a lot of what we say. And a lot of what we say is about objects moving along trajectories. So we can talk about a trajectory frame. And a trajectory frame will have elements like this. It has an object moving along a trajectory that ends up at a destination. It might start out at a, at a source. It's probably been arranged by some kind of agent. And that agent may 
assist himself in making the motion happen with some kind of instrument. There might be somebody helping out over here, a co-agent. Well, what else can we have? A uh, beneficiary, someone who is helped out by the action. Sometimes the motion is arranged by a conveyance. So these are a lot of slots, frame-like slots in descriptions of actions, many of which involve motion along a trajectory. We uh, have a tendency in language to decorate these things in one way or another, depending on the language. In some languages, the decoration is by way of position in a sentence. In English, it's often by way of a preposition that's used to help zero in on the role of a, on, on the particular role of a, an object in the trajectory uh, scenario. So if I say I um, baked a cake with a friend, there's a with preposition. If I bake the cake for a friend, the friend is the beneficiary. If I baked a cake with an oven, that's an instrument. The object may be moving to a destination from a source. And if I'm going to New York by train, I put a by on top of that. If the agent isn't in subject position, I would say something like, oh, uh, the, uh, all the work was done by a student. So those prepositions have a tendency to help us to zero in on the actual role of particular objects in this whole package, this whole frame. So this is number three. And there's a variation on this in which there's no actual trajectory, in which case we'll just call that a roll frame. Because if there's no trajectory, we can still have things such as an instrument, a co-agent, and a beneficiary. So now we've got uh, three representations. You might say, well, what good are they? And uh, you can determine what good they are these days because it's easier to go over uh, established corpuses and say what fraction of those, of the sentences in such a corpus involve a classification or a transition or a trajectory. The most uh, well-known of these is the so-called Wall Street Journal corpus. It has 50,000 sentences in it drawn from some period of time. All the language, syntactical language types uh, work with, a, with that corpus a great deal. And we worked with it a little bit too to see what fraction of the, of the sentences or what the density of trajectories and transitions are in those sentences. So I have to say that a little more a little carefully because the finding is that in 100 sentences, you'll find about 25 transitions or trajectories. So they're very densely represented. Uh, they're often very abstract. Prices rose. Uh, the uh, economy uh, went to uh, someplace. Uh, but there are there's still words that denote transition or trajectory. But of course, once you you have all this stuff, uh, that you have a, a you begin to have a desire to put it together. And so the next thing uh, we need to talk about is uh, story sequences. So a story sequence can be a single sentence, and I want to illustrate that with uh, one of my favorites. Uh, here's the sentence. There, I think I've chosen gender neutral names so it's not to get any trouble. So Pat, by the way, I don't call myself Pat because I decided when I was 18 years old that Pat is a unit of measure for butter. In any case, Pat comforted Mary. Do you have an image of what happened? Probably not a very firm image. You know that Pat did something, uh, but you don't know exactly what. Uh, nevertheless, uh, when Pat comforted Chris, you can construct uh, something uh, that looks like 
a, a roll frame. Because the roll frame for that would have an agent, and that would be pat. Uh, there's an action. We're going to put a question mark in there because we don't have a very firm image of what the action is. In any event, we're building a roll frame, like so. Uh, the object is Chris. Oh, let's, you know that is the object. Is there anything else we can say? Ah, uh, yes, we can probably say something more. Something else comes to mind when you, when you see Pat Company to Chris. There's a, res, there's a sort of result. And the result is a transition frame. And the transition frame involves an object, which is Chris. And Chris has a mood, which presumably uh, is improved. It, it, it goes up. Did you have something, Elliot? Could you, I guess, analogize the pet comfort of Chris to something kind of like pet gave comfort to Chris, which yeah. is Chris's the destination, yeah. and comfort is the. Elliot is wandering into a very interesting area having to do with, couldn't you think about this in another way and think of it as um, a, a something moving along a trajectory? Comfort is moving, uh, if not from Pat, at least to Chris. And that's a very important kind of observation because what it, what it suggests is that there can be a, a utility in thinking of things in multiple ways, multiple representations. Marvin Minsky has a, a, a wonderful aphoristic phrase, is, which is, if you can only think about something in one way, there, there's, you have no recourse when you get stuck. So multiple representations mean you have multiple ways of gathering regularity from the world and collecting it, and therefore that'll make you smarter. So yes, you could do it that. You could do that, and that would be a complement to what I'm doing now. But let me continue with what I'm doing now. So what have I done? I've got a roll frame and a transition frame, and the transition frame is the target of the result slot in the, uh, in the roll frame. Now we can uh, modify this a little bit. And maybe we want to say, uh, instead of comforted, uh, terrorized. And how would that change things? We don't know exactly what Pat did, so the action remains unknown. The agent and the object are the same, but the result here is presumably that the moved went down. Just what we've got so far, we can answer a lot of questions, by the way. Once we've got the, the sentence understood in these terms, we can say, who did the thing? Who, who, what's this all about? And, and the answer is Pat. What did Pat do? Comfort, terrorize. Who did he do it to? Always the object. It's Chris. What was the result? Chris felt better. Chris felt, wor felt worse. So, so these, re these representations already give us a questioning answering capability that, uh, makes, the, uh, makes, the, that makes for an understanding of, of the sentence. Uh, still, we haven't been very specific, so our next step takes this, this same sentence in a more specific direction. So here's the way that goes. Um, kissed Chris. Now you begin to get a sense of what's going on. Uh, you can form a mental image so that you can, you can have a hallucination. And that hallucination will also be a kind of frame, but in this case, it'll be a trajectory frame. And the object would be, I don't know, Pat's lips. And the destination would be Chris's lips. 
I don't know. Is that right? It depends. It depends. Have you all formed a, a picture of what's going on here? So it will be different depending on whether uh, Chris is Pat's girlfriend or if Chris is Pat's daughter or if Chris is a frog and Pat is a prince. That's, I guess, the way the story usually goes. <laughs> So somehow we have in our heads all kinds of libraries that help us to form mental pictures of things when we see things like Kist. So one, one final one, just to show the variety. We could say that uh, Pat stabbed Chris. What changes? Uh, let's see, in the case of um, Kist, the mood is going up. In the case of stabbed, the mood is going down. And you can also probably say that the health is going down. And the destination is Chris's body. And the object that's moving is Pat's knife. But you get the same pattern uh, with both of those sentences. So both of them involve a sequence that starts off with the action leads to a transition and a trajectory, and those are all arranged in a line. And that line is something that gives us a lot of power over the situation relative to a semantic net. So I'm going to decorate that one more time and say that another element we get out of our internal language is sequence. Another element we need in order to have an, anything that looks like an account of an inner language is sequence. Because if you think about things being arrayed in a vast spreading network, it's hard to deal with them. But if you think about things being arrayed along a line in a sequence of actions or events like so, then that imposes enough constraint to get a handle on what's going on. So what we're going to call this is the representation. And I guess I'm up to one, two, three, four. This is a representation of story sequence. So even though that's a kind of micro story, it's still an example of a, of a story sequence because we get the power out of it by arranging everything in a line. Now, do you, 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 under, you, you, you have a sense, I think, especially if you play a music, musical instrument, of how dependent we are on sequence. So if you play a musical instrument, you probably know how difficult it is to start replaying a piece of music from the middle of a measure. You have to go back to at least the beginning of the measure and probably to the beginning of the phrase, if not the beginning of the piece. So our memory seems to be, at least in music, very rooted in the, in, in, in the idea of sequences. And that's often true in storytelling, too. We have to go back to the beginning of a, at least a scene, because somehow these things are arranged in in, in, in sequences that, that form somehow useful, usefulness out of their sequentialness. So there's one more thing we can talk about, and that is the idea of not just the idea of how these sequences are constructed and what they're constructed out of, but we can also talk a little bit in terms of uh, libraries of stories. And when we talk about libraries of stories, we can think about kind of the sort of standard, standard stories that we have and how they're arranged and how we can know a lot about something by what its superclass is. So it's a variation on the theme of learning stuff from the superclasses. So here's, here's an event frame. And uh, then there's, a, in addition to uh, event frames, there are disaster frames. And then there are party frames. And you know, parties and disasters are both events. And when we talk about disasters, we know that they in turn break up into a variety of things. We have earthquake disasters. And maybe we have hurricanes. <laughs> 
And in the party world, we have, I don't know, birthday parties. And we have weddings. And each of these types of frames invites us to fill in particular slots. So if we're reading a newspaper story about a wedding, uh, we know that uh, we're going to be learning the same sorts of things we would learn about any party, except there is the addition, additional information that we expect that says something about uh, the bride and the groom. If we have a, a raw event and we don't know anything more about it than that, there's a time and place. If it's a disaster frame, uh, it gets a little grisly over here, but if there's a disaster frame, frame, we might have the fatalities. And how much it, how much it uh, cost. If it's an earthquake frame, we need to know the magnitude uh, of the uh, of, of the quake and the name of the fault. If it's a hurricane, we have the category and the name. So each of these things up there can be viewed as, as a, you know, not just an example of something, but as a, as, as a new frame all by itself. So as we, as we mature, we have these first four things as building blocks, and then we, we educate ourselves and we get all those kinds of frames that help us to understand the world. But uh, how to fill those in from a newspaper story can be some, sometimes quite a challenge. Actually, the worst thing to understand uh, is um, children's stories. Because, um, and this was determined uh, experimentally when people tried to understand children's stories, because it turns out the children's stories are not simpler than the, than the stories we write for adults. In many cases, they are they're harder. If you read about Shakespearean plots, it's all about intrigue, murder, jealousy, greed. But when you're talking about a children's story, it can be about anything. And worse yet, the uh, children's story often raises problems that you don't see in newspaper stories. Let me illustrate that for you. i read that story. You have no trouble figuring it out, of course, uh, but think about a poor machine that's struggling to understand anything. What's going to be the problem? It's going to have trouble figuring out those pronoun antecedents. Uh, look at them, they're complicated. They're the pronouns. One of them wanted to buy a kite. He has one. He said he will make you take it back. So that's pretty hard. Actually, uh, the principle here that I'm, I'm driving at is when you have a new story or any story, if you have an old story but you want to read it, but you want to understand it quickly, the new instantiation of it quickly, you need to be sure that if you're the storyteller, you don't add to the burden of the understanding any syntactic difficulty. So that's an example of telling a story with additional syntactic difficulty. No uh, newspaper journalist would ever write the story like that. Here's how they would write it. They would even, they would even give you a clue uh, that there's certain information you're never going to get, like uh, who told the story. That's that reliable sources business. So this brings us to the, uh, to the, to the uh, final uh, bit that I want to deal with today. And what I'm going to do is, I'm, I'm, if you came into this class today as a 97-pound writing weakling, uh, you are about to emerge as a 250-pound mountain of a writer. Because I want to tell you a few tricks that will make you usually better as a writer, especially, especially if you're Russian or German. And here's how it works. Rule one. <laughs> 
because they place additional syntactic burden on the understanding of the story by the reader. So if you're, teaching, so if you're telling somebody about some difficult new technical idea, the last thing you want them to do is to burden their syntactic processor with figuring out pronoun antecedents. So don't use pronouns, and your writing, technical writing at least, will be much clearer. By the way, why does this especially apply to Germans and Russians? Is it because, is this, is this an ethnic origin slur, or is this a fact about their language? It's a fact about their language. What is the fact? Why can they get away with pronoun usages that we cannot get away with in English? Yes, Andrew? Gender. Although that's gender, but also gender. 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 Because if you have uh, all of your, all of your uh, nouns decorated uh, with, with gender, that reduces by three uh, the, 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 the potential for ambiguity in the pronoun antecedent. So you'll frequently find that German and Russian writers will have pronouns all over the place that are perfectly clear to them because of gender that are uninterpretable by English speakers when translated because we don't have the gender to help us zero in. So uh, these things are all have to do with minimizing extra superfluous, gratuitous, unnecessary burden on the reader. Number two is don't use former or latter. You see that those words used frequently in technical writing, and guess what? No human being ever encounters those words without having to stop and go back to figure out what they refer to. So that's another example of not placing an unnecessary syntactic burden on the reader. And finally, don't call a shovel a spade. There's a, there's a habit probably instilled by well-meaning but misadvised high school teachers that you shouldn't repeat words. And so people will go to great length and use some different word. The problem is that the reader doesn't know if the shift in the word is deliberate and attached to some subtle meaning shift, or if it's just adhering to some high school teacher's admonition against using the same word again. So you don't want to say, oh, uh, the right way to dig this particular hole is with the spade, and then switch to a shovel, because you, the reader can't tell if it's deliberate, accidental, uh, or a consequence of just the desire not to use the same word. So uh, this is how you can, with, with some very simple mechanisms, Grounded in AI, you can actually make yourself into a better writer by avoiding those kinds of things that put an unnecessary syntactic burden on the people who are reading your stuff.